Good morning. Welcome to the first Business World Insights online forum on assessing the coronavirus pandemic's impact on the Philippine economy. I'm Willie Reyes, Editor-in-Chief of Business World, and I will moderate this forum. 
We're privileged to have with us today four experts who will share their insights on the economic conditions that we face in this pandemic. Each one will now give his opening statement. The first speaker is the Assistant Secretary in charge of the Finance Department's Strategy, Economics, and Results Group. He leads a team now working on tax and related reforms. And before this, he was the head of public policy at Ayala Corporation. He is Assistant Secretary Antonio Lambino II. Good morning, Mr. Lambino. Good morning, Willie, and uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, greetings to my fellow panelists, Dr. Kolibali, Ambassador Yuhiko, of course, and Dr. Chikiamko, and everyone viewing uh, this uh, session this morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share updates on our socioeconomic response to COVID-19 and to have this uh, discussion with representatives from different sectors. I would like to start by saying that for the Duterte administration, the most urgent priority is to save lives and protect communities amid the ongoing pandemic. Our action plan to achieve this is outlined in the economic team's four pillar strategy. Namely, first, to support vulnerable sectors through emergency support initiatives. Second, to marshal resources to help the Department of Health and our frontline healthcare workers fight COVID-19. Third, to take fiscal and monetary actions to finance emergency and short to medium term initiatives to keep the economy afloat. And fourth, to formulate and implement an economic recovery plan to create jobs and sustain growth. Our strong macroeconomic fundamentals have put us in a good position to respond to this pandemic. We attribute these strengths to the economic and fiscal policy continuity from one administration to the next and to President Duterte's conservative approach to fiscal and economic policy. Our growth um, in 2019 in terms of GDP was at 5.9%, a strong figure in comparison with the rest of Asia and the rest of the world. And our annual GDP growth average from 2016 to 2019 was at 6.4%. Our revenue to GDP ratio in 2019 was also the highest in 22 years at 16.9%. Our debt to GDP ratio in 2019 stood at a very manageable 41.5%, uh, uh, way down from the peak in 2004 of 74.4%. Our inflation rate in March 2020 is well within the 2 to 4% uh, target range. Uh, we are at 2.5% uh, as of March 2020. Uh, there is ample room in our overall financial position to absorb additional borrowings. Uh, partners have been extending concessional terms, such as the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the AIIB, and other development partners. And the bond market has been responding very positively to our offerings, even even during this pandemic, given our very strong uh, financial and economic position prior to the pandemic. Um, the economic recovery team uh, is now crafting our short to medium term bounce back plan so that we can get back to our growth trajectory. And more importantly, get the Filipino people back to work. Thank you. Thank you for that situationer, uh, Asik Lambino. The Thank next you, the next panelist is the World Bank's lead economist and program leader for the at the World Bank uh, for the Brunei for Brunei Malaysia the Philippines and Thailand, Suleiman Kolibali. He has been in the country since February last year, and before that, he was in charge of Central African Economics. Good morning, Doctor Kolibali. Good morning. Good morning, uh, uh, Willie. Uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, attending uh, uh, this uh, forum online. Um, so let me uh, start by saying that uh, this COVID-19 crisis is first um, a health shock um, to the economy. So it's a supply shock in this sense to economies around the world, including in the Philippines. A supply shock um, because labor supply is constrained by direct health impact, 
people getting sick, some dying, and indirect health impact with self-quarantine or time taken to, to care for family members. It's a supply shock also because measures adopted to suppress or contain the propagation of the virus, virus like uh, the travel bans, social distancing, lockdowns, affect the production of some sectors directly, like the transportation sector, the tourism sector, mass entertainment, uh, or indirectly also if the sectors are deemed non-essential, like manufacturing of products that are sold in malls, restoration, a wide range of other services. So the immediate impact of this supply shock is an income shortfall uh, for workers and entrepreneurs. That can turn into an aggregate demand shock if uh, the measures are harsher and longer in terms of uh, the time it takes. In the case of the Philippines, where a Luzon-wise um, wide enhanced community quarantine was adopted since March, uh, mid-March, it means that 70% of the national economy is directly affected by this combined supply and demand shock. The government effort to provide income to the poor and vulnerable for two months and secure firms access to liquidity through the Bayanian or To Heal As One Act is important for cautioning the economic impact of the lockdown. But the health crisis might take longer to be fully under control and the government might not have the fiscal space to cover the income shortfall over a longer period. The longer it takes to address the health crisis, the deeper the combined supply and demand shocks might be with the additional risk of the stability of the financial sector weakening, which could trigger a second uh, round of supply shock followed by a much larger demand shock fueled by precautionary saving, for instance, by consumers and weaker investment confidence. On the other hand, the COVID-19 pandemic might also accelerate the move of the Philippine economy to digitalization, which would in turn improve the aggregate productivity of the economy over the medium term. The current crisis is also helping the country to strengthen its health and social protection systems, which together with an improved education system and business environment, fully leveraging new technologies, are poised to accelerate growth over the medium to long term. So we have the short term crisis challenge, which is a health crisis, which is you know, uh, translating itself first as a supply shock, but also we have over the long term an opportunity to strengthen the economy and the World Bank stand to work with uh, Philippines and its other uh, counterparts around, around the world to really leverage this uh, crisis over the medium term. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kaluban. Uh, next, we have the president of the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry, who had served as special envoy for the president for trade relations with Eastern Europe, Ambassador Benedic Benedicto Uico. Good morning, Hi. Ambassador. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Willie. Good morning, Asek Tony. Good morning, Dr. Sue Kolibali. Good morning, Mr. Calixto Jim Kianko. You know, before I give my short uh, opening remarks, I was elected president of PCCI effective January. And now I'm in the middle of a big fight against COVID. I said, mm, maybe this is not a lucky time to be president of PCCI. I'm just joking. I'm happy to serve. I'm happy to be part of the team that will help the Philippines overcome this difficulty. The COVID-19 pandemic has crippled the world economy, including our country. We are in the brink of a major recession. Our local businesses, large or small, are struggling to survive. Businesses are forced to explore all possibilities to overcome this unprecedented crisis. Due to quarantine regulations, certain industries have been affected more than others. Businesses involved in the essential goods and services sector are for the most part operational. The non-essential businesses remain closed. With the government now issuing partial reopening guidelines, Existing businesses will now have to plan and implement their reopening strategy 
uh, to be sufficient to address the variables presented by the COVID. Like, for example, we have to make sure that we are able to maintain safety standards, safety, like safe distancing, masks, etc. As the uh, primary organization that is fully dedicated to supporting the growth of the development of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, PCCI is closely following how the pandemic is affecting MSMEs with a particular focus on those small businesses in the localities. In various forums with our members, their biggest struggles with a slowdown in market demand is the increasing cost of our materials and intermediate goods. This is particularly true for members who are trading with countries that are greatly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, such as China, United States, and Japan. Now, for both members, large and small, catering to the domestic market and international market, losses are attributed to the imposition of travel restrictions that caused late shipments, canceled orders, loss of suppliers and buyers. Newfound difficulties include complications in obtaining loans, delays in remittances of payments, cancellations of credit lines, and of course, excess manpower. What small, per what small firms are expecting out of an intervention from the government are drastic measures concerning financial assistance. As the health crisis is altering economies, in the short term, our members are requesting support in the forms of tax breaks and loan assistance and a review of processes to accelerate the movement of goods. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Yuriko, and uh, I'm sure we all wish you well in your baptism of fire. Our fourth speaker is the president of the Foundation for Economic Freedom and is himself a columnist of Business World, Mr. Calixto Chikyamko. He authored a book, The Way Forward, The Path to Inclusive Growth, that was published in 2016, and he co-authored another book titled Momentum, Economic Reforms for Sustaining Growth. Good morning, Mr. Chikyamko. Good morning, Willie. Uh... Good morning to my fellow panelists. Um, the administration is projecting flat to slightly less than 1% growth of the Philippine economy. I think that's even optimistic, given the many negative external and internal factors and the government's very hard lockdown, one of the most stringent in the world, with banning of mass public transport and the slow motion approach it is taking to opening up the economy. We probably will have a vast wasteland, no animal spirits, much weaker banks, and a vast number of unemployed after this crisis. Aggravating the crisis are the weakness of our institutions in the processes in implementing a strategy to counter the effects of this crisis. For example, without a national ID, the DSWD has been struggling to distribute the social amelioration funds for 18 million households. The website of the social security system for the small business wage subsidy program keeps crashing. Fiscal stimuli is useless if the institutions aren't capable of delivering it. In sum, the economic damage will be severe. If the virus spread is exponential, the economic damage will also be exponential as the lo lockdown and restrictions drag on. Recovery will be long and uncertain. If we do not make structural reforms as a result of this crisis, the painful experience we underwent would have gone for nothing. Thank you. Thank you for your views, Mr. Chikyamko. Let's now proceed with discussions. Uh, various Philippine economic forecasts by the government, think tanks, 
uh, multilateral organizations like the World Bank and Bank Economists, they are all increasingly increasingly putting uh, 2020 growth uh, projections at slight contraction to near flat growth at the very best. And their own, some of our own economic managers like uh, Finance Secretary uh, Dominguez and uh, Central Bank Governor uh, Jokno uh, have chimed in on their own personal forecasts. My question, my first question is to Asik Nambino. When will economic managers of the DBCC, the Development Budget Coordination Committee, meet to finalize new official macro assumptions? And what has been the growing uh, consensus, if any, on GDP growth this year and in 2021? Yeah, thank you for that, Willie. Uh, you know, the DBCC, of course, is continually uh, coordinating on uh, these uh, uh, decisions that need to be made. And let me just uh, highlight that uh, as Secretary Dominguez has, uh, has emphasized, uh, and partly in response to uh, what uh, Dr. Chikiamko uh, shared earlier, um, the decisions that we are faced with and ultimately the president has to make are not only economic, they are ethical and moral. And actually, weeks ago, um, and uh, there, are, there were certain business groups that uh, uh, shared their, uh, their position papers on uh, wanting an accelerated opening up. Uh, the secretary asked for uh, estimates of the trade-offs uh, between the uh, economic uh, uh, side of the equation and the health and the well-being side of the equation of our citizens. And it's not a, it's not a black or white uh, trade-off that we're talking about. It's uh, livelihoods and lives that we're talking about. And even with that urging, and the, despite having the resources to do this type of analysis, having access to actuaries and economists and the like, uh, the private sector never provided uh, this type of analysis. So we did it ourselves. You know? And that, uh, that analysis has been made available to the IATF. You know, it's not just about uh, the uh, economic slowdown. It's also about how many people will get infected as we open up uh, slowly in a moderate way or, or in a quick way. Uh, how many people will die after being infected? What is the mortality rate? What is the estimates? Uh, what are our estimates uh, given various scenarios? And that was requested and was never forthcoming. So we have done that work and that is guiding the decision-making process of the IATF. Now, with regard to the economy itself, um, everything now depends on how long uh, the ECQ is needed in order to save lives and to um, uh, and to protect our communities. How fast uh, global demand will bounce back as well. Uh, the implementation of the lockdown has indeed slowed down uh, private consumption, a large uh, contributor to GDP, uh, to our GDP growth. Uh, we might also see some increase in the unemployment figures. Uh, around 1.2 million is our most recent estimate in the short run, uh, given the slowing down of private consumption. Um, if some areas are downgraded to uh, general community quarantine, subject to certain uh, conditions, such as minimum health standards being met, such as uh, being able to protect people through social distancing on public transportation, uh, tra public transportation options, uh, then uh, we might see private consumption to start increasing for the remainder of the year. Um, on the infrastructure side, uh, public spending on infra, uh, it's also delayed no? uh, for the first half of the year. However, um, in 2019, it was able to bounce back immediately. For us this year, uh, it would depend you know, on how many uh, areas uh, we'll have to stay under ECQ uh, under the conditions I just talked about um, and how uh, government will be able to uh, allocate, uh, reallocate resources. That said, infrastructure is certainly uh, a priority. It has massive uh, uh, multiplier effects. And of course, our social investments, especially in the healthcare sector. Um, so, a, a couple of notes on the on the subsidies uh, that uh, the government launched immediately under Pillar One of its uh, social economic strategy. Um, the DSWD has uh, implemented uh, new guidelines uh, requiring local governments to release 
funds to beneficiaries within 24 hours of receipt of those funds. Um, also, it's, uh, I guess, important to note that because of the Four Peace Program, uh, partially supported by uh, the World Bank um, uh, and implemented by DSWD, 3.7 million uh, households or families were able to receive uh, their subsidy right away. Uh, in terms of the small business wage subsidy, actually, we're still in our application phase. And while the SSS website did experience a number of issues uh, and crashes, uh, there were alternate uh, application methods that were made available through uh, cloud-based uh, secure options, uh, email-based, and also uh, website-based. And uh, these are ongoing uh, and have been up and running uh, for the past few days. Uh, and uh, now we have more than around 1 million uh, beneficiaries that have been validated out of the 3.4 million total beneficiaries. And in fact, the payouts will probably start earlier than the scheduled uh, May 1 release. Now, so uh, there are many things that are ongoing. Uh, at the same time, we have to continue funding our fight against COVID-19 led by the health department. We need to raise resources such as uh, those from the uh, Asian Development Bank, AIIB, and the World Bank, uh, represented by uh, Dr. Su uh, in this forum. Uh, around 5.7 billion US dollars are expected to come online uh, by the end of this month, no? in a few days. And uh, additional uh, liquidity has been uh, pumped into the economy by monetary actions by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, such as the lowering of the RRR uh, to by 200 basis points uh, around uh, uh, 200 billion uh, pesos of additional liquidity. For the small businesses, additional programs are about to be launched. Uh, a uh, 120 billion worth of loans uh, to be guaranteed under fail guarantee and uh, a legislative effort to uh, extend uh, the NOLCO from three to five years for losses incurred in 2020. So those are some of the things that, we're, that are being done. The DBCC is constantly monitoring the situation and uh, these uh, policy decisions uh, will be recommended to the president very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, really, okay. uh, this is yes. Benedict yes, uh, Can I Can I ask a question or make yes, a comment? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, you know, I was watching a, a, a interview of the Federal Reserve Chairman in the U.S., and uh, the comment was, there is not amount of money that can be thrown into the U.S. economy to restart it. Uh, they were uh, commenting this because they were talking of $4 trillion that they would prepare to restart the U.S. economy. Uh, they are very, very concerned that there are 26 million unemployed. And so they are trying to develop all kinds of fiscal and monetary stimulus to restart it. But the comment was, there's not amount of money that can be thrown at the economy to restart it, which is, they mean is, we need business to start. Without business restarting, you cannot throw enough to restart it. So with this in mind, I am observing that in more advanced countries like America, there is now great debate whether to restart business or not. Georgia went number one. Okay, they are starting. California is more conservative. But there is a general awareness that business has to start pretty soon. Spain, Italy, and Germany. Germany is a very responsible country with responsible leaders. What are they doing? Uh, they are restarting. Now, these countries are very rich. They can support social amelioration programs longer, I think, than Philippines or even other developing economies. But what they are doing today is focusing on restarting economies. And that is what we hope in the business sector will be allowed uh, by the government. Now, I, I just want to say that we are supportive of government. We, we will follow the guidelines that are issued by the government. I'm just making a comment that my observations of what the other countries are doing, and I'm just sharing it to our uh, viewers. Um, can I come in? Uh, yes, please. Yes, yeah, quickly maybe to reflect on what uh, Ambassador just said and uh, before him, uh, um, Asik uh, Tony. Um, I think the, the, the point I wanted to push, uh, to at least to flag, is we are facing uh, first a, a supply shock because of the health nature of the initial crisis. 
and then this has led to a demand shock. So because of this uh, particular nature of the crisis, that is not the same as the crisis we had before, you know, uh, in 2008, uh, it was a financial uh, sector crisis that started the problem. And in other years, it was, for instance, the oil uh, shocks that created the problem. Here, we have a health shock that is creating uh, a supply shock. So unless these health uh, challenges is under, is under control, and the signal from the population at large, for consumer at large, is that you know things are under control, it will be really difficult to be to have a very effective uh, resume, uh, uh, resumption of economic activities. So this is a point I wanted to flag. It's true that the economy should be driven by the private sector, by businesses, but businesses are not existing alone. Consumers need to be buying. Consumers need to be making decisions. And if we focus even on um, you know the middle class, not the daily earners who need to go out to earn something, if we look at the middle class. They will be, you know, making decision on, you know, is it safe for me to go to entertainment, to go to this kind of goods that I can, you know, postpone if it's not necessary. And because of this decision of, of, of consumers, even if business want to open, it will really be difficult to have a thriving economy. So I think the priority is really to have a health uh, situation under control. And I think the government has been effective with the ECQ. You know, a few of the developing countries have been as, as tough as the Philippines to put these measures. Now, let's hope that we'll see quickly that the, the, the epidemic is under control. And then consumers will start making decisions. Business will start making decisions informed by the fact that the government is really, really on top of the health crisis. And then everything else will go on. For instance, consumption is a main driver of growth. It's meant that as soon as consumers decide to uh, behave normally, the economy will slowly go back to where it was before the crisis. So I want to stop here. Thank you, doctor. Yes, uh, Mr. Chicampo. Well, I, I uh, disagree with my friend, Sue, uh, that it is uh, primarily, let's say, uh, consumer behavior that will drive, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the economy. Because uh, I talked about this, uh, you know, in, in a article about the doom loop. Uh, because once um, uh, firms uh, start laying off, of course, uh, this will also uh, uh, lead to lower demand. Uh, you know, and lower demand in turn will lead to uh, uh, businesses uh, further closing and unemployment. So uh, uh, it, it's uh, it's both actually, as I said, there's change in consumer behavior because of, uh, uh, of the health crisis, but there's also an income effect. You know, the many people are just uh, don't have an income, especially those who have who uh, are a, uh, on a no work no pay basis uh, and then of course you you have the a lot of uh, maybe thousands of uh, OFWs who have lost jobs and uh, consumer spending is of course uh, a large part of our economy so that will uh, suffer uh, a blow Yes, thank you, Mr. Chikyampo. Before we go yeah, to... May, uh, I, may I add a, a comment also? I think yes, it's also please. important, again, to re-emphasize uh, the question that Secretary Dominguez posed to a number of uh, business groups and associations. What is the trade-off in terms of livelihoods, lives, and the ability of uh, people to stay healthy and the ability versus the ability of people to put food on the table, right? And how do we balance those concerns? And again, uh, the private sector is more than capable of doing that analysis. And when requested, uh, it, it just never came. So that's something that we need to, uh, that's what we need to grapple with uh, in terms of uh, policy decision making. It is not a purely economic decision. It is ethical, moral. Um, it has to be driven by science. It has to be informed by epidemiology, data science, uh, Economics, etc. And the well, U.S. Was, the United States was raised as, as an example. Um, news reports have uh, have uh, illustrated that uh, the coronavirus has killed more Americans than uh, the Vietnam War did. So again, uh, please uh, uh, consider uh, what is uh, our threshold. What is our moral and ethical compass telling us in terms of? our willingness to see uh, infections rise 
and uh, the death uh, and the mortality rate uh, kick in you know, based on the number of those infections. As we know, around 2% of uh, infections uh, end up in, uh, in death. So what we're proposing is a calibrated, a purposeful reopening of the economy, given, uh, again, what I mentioned earlier first, are locations able to meet minimal health standards that will protect the people? Second, are public transportation options uh, being set up in ways that will uh, allow for social distancing? Third, um, what are the population factors in terms of, uh, of risks no, to, uh, to infection and, uh, and mortality? So for instance, uh, what age groups are most vulnerable? We know that uh, younger age groups, uh, 20 and below, uh, tend to spread the virus more to uh, the, mo the most vulnerable age group, uh, the senior citizens. Uh, most of the deaths uh, are from the groups uh, 50 years old and above. Um, what businesses are essential to uh, the, uh, the revival of uh, certain parts of our economy? And uh, uh, which workers uh, will be able to come in under what conditions? Uh, so all of these things uh, need to uh, come into play as the as the policy decisions are made. And uh, I would like to, again, uh, emphasize that question because it was asked and uh, no answer was forthcoming, which is why uh, Secretary Dominguez uh, formed a team that uh, looked into that. And those, uh, those analyses are uh, guiding uh, the decision-making process. Thank you. Thank you, Asik. Uh, I, I'm sure we appreciate the difficult balancing act in policymaking right now. Uh, the, um, Mr. Chikyanko, can you just tell us, uh, you were talking about the uh, doom book, but do you see that risk? Uh, are we on the, any, on the verge of such a risk? Uh, 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 pardon? The doom, the doom loop yes, that you yes. wrote about, are we on the verge of such a risk? Uh, of such a risk? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, th I think so. Uh, a lot of, uh, I don't know, uh, Ambassador uh, Yuiko can... can you know, many MSMEs, uh, which provide the majority of employment uh, 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 here, um, I think they can do with uh, maybe one month uh, of, of stoppage. But I think uh, on the two months, they're already uh, out of working capital and I think facing bankruptcy. Um, uh, that is uh, uh, my view. That uh, So that is... Uh, what I'm referring to the, as the as the doom loop, you know, um, you know. So uh, and uh, well, I don't want to uh, uh, quarrel with my friend Tony about uh, uh, you know the ethical. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure all, everybody is um, understands that that there's a uh, uh, a balancing act that we have to do. So. Um, Although I have to point out that Vietnam has no deaths at only 270 cases, and they have already um, opened up, uh, started opening up. But anyway, I I, uh, I think, uh, though, that what we have to focus on is how to restart the economy, given, of course, uh, this reality that the, uh, the virus will be with us, is how do we restart the economy? Uh, Sue said that, uh, you know, we cannot start until the health thing is, is fixed no but i think we can uh we can and especially i think the crisis has shown that uh, food production is very important and i think uh government policy should be oriented toward uh, improving uh, uh um you know food production thank you sir um, um can i quickly you... follow up uh, yeah. uh, uh, yes, I, yeah so i didn't say that the economy cannot restart uh, unless the health uh, crisis is addressed i said under control which means that at least uh, the, it's it's possible um, for the health uh, um, system to track to see where people are being contaminated and how to contain this contamination it doesn't mean that we have zero contamination but it means that the system is now sound enough to control and the disease became become like a regular disease where we have a, a surveillance system in place and the two months of the lockdown i think uh, has been uh, helpful to at least collect enough information so i'm assuming that the government will take some decision to slowly move back to normal, not drastically, not immediately, but slowly 
as they implement some of the information they collected during these two, two lockdown months. Now, the challenge is a medium to long term. Because if the crisis is still there, if we have second round infection in China, in the rest of Europe, around the world, we'll have a, a demand shock that will be stronger now on the external side. And then this, even if Philippines is controlling everything, this might have a second wave, uh, a second wave effect on the domestic economy. So there are a lot of uncertainty related to this particular disease, but if the right measures are taken, to have a, the health crisis under control. Again, I'm not saying totally stopping the, 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 the infection, but under control, then decision will be made by consumers, but by, by investors, uh, you know, on an individual basis, because they realize that, you know, the economy is sound, the measures are sound, and they take their, also their own share by investing, by consuming, by taking some risk, by going out. But this need to be uh, informed by how strong and how convincing the government measures have been. And I think so far, my own assessment looking at other developing countries in the Philippines has been doing the right thing so far. Yes. Well, your own, your own, uh, your own uh, report earlier this month uh, said that the ultimate solution is a vaccine and that will come in in 18 months at best, okay. well, actually. Uh, but uh, then I it will I take lost, six. I mean, not I lost 18 months and then... Uh, another six months to spread it throughout the world. So that's like two years, right? So is that going to be the situation that we're facing? Because a number of economists, both in government and private sector, are saying hopefully we'll have some rebound in the fourth quarter and next year. But with that kind of scenario on the vaccine, apparently in the next two years, we're going to see very muted economic, economic activity. Uh, this is this is a, a, the reality of the crisis. I think this is a particularity of this crisis compared to many others. Because as I said, in 2008, we had a financial crisis that triggered all the spillover effects. Uh, in the 75, for instance, we had an oil, oil shock that created. So we, it's, it's a very specific shock this time around because of the health nature of the crisis. And this is what is making it maybe one of the major crisis since the, the Great Depression in the, in the 30s. So we need to acknowledge that this is a major crisis. Uh, some countries will be hit much more than others. And one of the particularities is also the largest economies are really hard hit. China, the US, Germany, all of these manufacturing households in the world are affected. So the spillover effect in many other economies, even if these uh, individual economies are doing the right thing, will be large. So we need to acknowledge that this is a major crisis. It can be there for a while. And, you know, governments need to handle this crisis the right way. First, by having the health crisis under control and then seeing how to protect the most vulnerable part of the population. Now, if it takes longer, we will have a fiscal challenge because government cannot continue to borrow, uh, you know, to, 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 to provide for uh, daily income earners. So it will be a real challenge. Um, but we are not there yet, so let's assume that at least the health crisis will be under control quickly so that it gives a signal to consumers and investors that everything is under control, even if we still have some risk, and they start to get involved through the spending, through the decision of investing, and then we will contain the crisis. It will not be the 6% growth like uh, uh, Asek Tony mentioned, but maybe it will be zero this year or even minus one or two this year, but next year slowly we will see some resumption of the economy. Zero to minus yeah, uh, one. Because uh, can, can, earlier this, uh, can you hear? Ambassador, yes. Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, just on the side, uh, Dr. Kalabali, earlier this month, the report, your report put uh, projected growth at negative 0.5 to 3%. And now everyone's saying that's even that's too optimistic now. So now you're saying that it's, uh, can you mention that uh, the new projection again? It's um, we are working on our new projection. Um, so we will be issuing our Philippine economic update uh, in June. So we used to be issuing it in uh, October and April. This year, we decided to issue it in, uh, um, uh, in June and uh, in January. So our upcoming economic update will revise our estimation. It will definitely be downward because by the time we were uh, pro uh, pro providing the numbers in April, uh, the health situation was not as bad as what we have now. So we have now this information. We'll have the Philippine Statistical uh, uh, Agency uh, numbers next week or so. So we'll factor all this. So you will have in, our, in the public domain in June 
our Philippine economic update that will provide our current asset, um, um, uh, estimation. It will be lower than, than what we have definitely. I can't uh, put numbers yet because we need to do the calculation. My team is ready to work on that. We are just waiting for the, the first quarter data. But we are also looking on, you know, on the medium term. And one of the special topic, the special topic of this uh, 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 economic update will be uh, the digital economy, how yeah. it's an opportunity right now to leverage not only the government work, but also the private sector, the schooling, so that, you know, the productivity in over the medium term also is improved. So let's not forget that there is also a positive element to this crisis that can be leveraged through digitalization of the economy. Thank you, Dr. Um, Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador, the government has already eased uh, containment restrictions in uh, a lot of provinces. Of course, for, for Metro Manila, they have extended it for two weeks, but all the rest, they have eased that. I, I get from your uh, comments that even that is, does not sit well with some businessmen. Is that true? Mr. Ambassador. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chikyamko, maybe I'll go first to you. Uh -huh. uh, could you just share with us uh, your views on what you see have been the emerging lessons so far uh, with this crisis? Oh, well, because I, I, I noticed, for instance, everyone's now talking about the national ID system, but well, that's been in the pipeline for 20 years. Everyone has, uh, now, now we have this so-called Balik Provincia uh, program that they're preparing, but I remember during the Ramos administration when I covered uh, the president then, uh, the, he had already raised that and we have to push uh, opportunities to the countryside. And uh, uh, can you just talk about your the lesson so far from this crisis? Uh, well, as I said, uh, uh, some of the lessons that uh, uh, we can take off is that, uh, first of all, um, uh, I think uh, we, we really, have, have, um, for example, even uh, Senator Bongo has said that we should have a um, Balik Provincia program, right? But uh, in order to for that to be successful, um, you know, th there should be jobs in the countryside, and I think um, that the, that's what I think the government has to do is to uh, make investing in the countryside um, attractive. So that's why in 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 my, in my, my columns of business world, I said that uh, uh, the government should look into um mining forestry and agriculture so those are the things that we should really focus on uh if you want uh, really to for people to move to the countryside and to uh, uh or at least to the second tier cities so as to decongest metro manila um so it cannot be business as usual we have to make really reforms structural reforms otherwise uh um uh, so speaking about digitalization, but uh, if uh, our internet uh, is not available to a lot of our our people, that will uh, that will not happen. So we have to make um, um, you know broadband access affordable with better better quality. So we need to liberalize. I think the economy, um, if possible, to lift the foreign ownership restrictions in the constitution, so that we could probably have. Uh, uh, better uh, public utility, uh, public uh, services. So apparently, uh, uh, Willie, really, can, really, can yeah. I interrupt? Can you? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Ambassador, I, I oh, just sorry. have a question okay. before and for for you. I, I kind of I kind of lost audio. So sorry. R right. So yeah, you're okay I, now. Uh, I lost audio. So now I'm back. Okay. okay. Thanks. Uh, the government uh, just a few days ago. Uh, lifted the containment restrictions in most of the country except for the national capital region and some areas. Um, that's uh, I see that as a as a result of its uh, very delicate band balancing act. But I get from your comments that even this uh, does not sit very well with some businesses. Uh, do you confirm that? Uh, were you asking me that? Uh, yeah, yes. 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 Yes, the business. Uh, no, the view it's, from not, the it's not. It's not really uh, a matter of uh, 
sitting well with some business, uh, but uh, uh, you know, businessmen always ask questions. And for example, they say, well, you know, if you want to provide employment and if we have budget for say public works, why don't we fix the streets now when there's no traffic? You know, questions like this. If in fact the idea is uh, not to have any contamination problems, well, you know, when people work in the streets, they are at least six feet or, or at least 12 feet or even further away. Uh, you know, some, some business uh, people are also asking, well, we have infrastructure projects, well, why don't we actually restart this to actually provide money flowing into the economy so that uh, people can actually start buying the necessary food and medicine and so on and so forth. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, uh, the uh, private sector uh, asking questions as to, well, why can't we do this when in fact uh, we are able to do, say, public works, fixing the streets, and not have to risk contamination. Uh, really, that, that's kind of the, the question that, that they're asking. Not so much questioning whether we should do it or not, but really saying there must be some other way. Uh, for example, I, I just want to mention that in Germany, uh, Volkswagen actually restarted or started to open up their plants again. They, they, they are not waiting whether uh, consumers will buy their products or not. I think the responsible way for Volkswagen to do is actually, okay, fine, let's restart this because if we don't start it, I mean, uh, where, where, is, where will we start this restarting of the economy? So big companies can, can do that. And so same principle with small companies. You know, uh, let's take uh, the case of a restaurant, a small restaurant at that, maybe with capacity of uh, 100 people. They realize that if they reopen, they cannot reopen with 100% capacity. They realize that they will probably open with 50% capacity and with additional costs because they will have to provide masks they have to provide gloves, and they will have to change the menu all the time. But they need to try because they know that the viral, that the vaccine or cure, there's no certainty as to, oh, it's coming next month or month after or whatever. So not knowing exactly when the uncertainty will end, they will have to try something. And this is what uh, the private sector, particularly the small size, small and medium scale enterprises, they want to try as long as it is consistent with government policy because if we are not going to have a vaccine uh, next month or two months later and they know that they cannot survive uh, another two or three months. They know that they cannot receive or will not be receiving further uh, assistance from the government. So they, they just want to try and try as early as possible. That's it. That's what I wanted to add. Um, well, yes. Can, uh, I, can I just comment that I agree with uh, the ambassador? I think we can trust the private sector to uh, uh, behave uh, responsibly and, protect, uh, you know, especially they want to protect their own workers uh, and also uh, make sure that uh, they do not endanger their customers. Uh, that is the reason why, for example, I think the private sector has taken the initiative in mass testing. Uh, I think uh, uh, Joby Concepcion has uh, led this effort uh, because uh, they are concerned, of course, for their own people, uh, which is uh, really the, the, uh, uh, the most important resource that they have. And therefore, that they will uh, do the responsible thing and uh, do tests so that they do not... Uh, uh, infect the others and also uh, apply uh, risk mitigation measures from requiring masks, doing some social distancing, uh, putting uh, uh, hand sanitizers in the workplace. So um, yes. uh, I think we can trust the private sector to do these things. And sometimes, you know, it's hard for the government to micromanage. For example, what are essentials? What are essential industries? Say food, agriculture, but you know you need plastics to produce to package the the food, you know. So um, I would 
try to trust the private sector more and give them a little bit more leeway. Thank you, Mr. Chikyamko, Ambassador. Uh, well, as they say, one of the silver linings in this current crisis is that it lays bare uh, whatever has to be fixed, both at the macroeconomic level and among industries and companies. Uh, one of the glaring uh, flaws of the system, I think, is uh, the clear incapacity of, incapacity of many local governments to step up. Uh, it's disheartening personally to hear uh, the national government saying that oh, we have already downloaded to local governments all the funds needed for the social amelioration program. But then when you check on the ground, less than half of the targets have received their monies. So um, my question, uh, Asik Lambino, uh, how does the national government plan to remedy this situation when the clock has been ticking for uh, those households and even the middle income families who suddenly find themselves among the ranks of the poor right now? Uh, how, how can the, how is, what is the national government planning to do to, to improve the situation at the local level and how fast can it do so? Yeah. Uh Thank you for that question, Willie. It's a very important one. And I touched on some of the responses earlier. Allow me to uh, restate them. First, as I mentioned, for the emergency subsidy program for 18 million families. And by the way, that's 75% of the uh, population of families in the country. Uh, the new guidelines have just been released where uh, LGUs have to release within uh, 24 hours of the download of funds. Second, uh, we have improved in terms of the social, uh, the small business wage subsidy program, previous programs where the processing was done manually. So now uh, it's automated. And uh, because it's automated, uh, the funds can be uh, distributed more quickly directly through bank accounts, uh, pay Maya accounts, or even uh, through remittance, uh, remittance services. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, we've done this uh, through not just the website, which had issues uh, for SSS, but also through an email uh, system to a secure uh, cloud-based service, and now through um, a purely cloud-based service with upload capacity for Excel spreadsheets. Now, so all of these things are being done already. Um, and uh, in addition, uh, the fail guarantee, which has consolidated a lot of guarantee programs in the country into something that is more professionally managed, uh, has uh, approved through a board resolution, uh, you know, 120 billion pesos worth of loans that uh, the government will guarantee, especially for small businesses, because the, the small businesses uh, were mentioned earlier as uh, the majority of, uh, of uh, firms in the country. And uh, they, in fact, they employ a majority of workers in the country. So uh, one of the things that we learned from a survey that was fielded uh, rather quickly uh, um, while the ECQ was in place and when it was just starting, it had four, more than 44,000 respondents. What are the pain points that small businesses are feeling? And according to uh, those uh, that uh, had to close down, uh, they needed support with uh, their expenses. So what, what was done right away, uh, grace periods for loans uh, with no interest on interest, no additional penalties, no fees, grace, uh, grace periods for, uh, for uh, rent, uh, the rental expenses, and now the small business wage subsidy as salary subsidies for the workers. That's what they said they needed help with. Second, for those that uh, had to close down partially, um, and don't see a quick U-shaped uh, recovery for their business. Um, they need access to credit, which is why the loan uh, guarantee program uh, worth 120 billion pesos of loan uh, was put in place. And lastly, uh, we are also uh, gonna work with Congress and uh, we already have uh, um, heard from members of uh, both the Senate and the House who want to sponsor this legislation, an extension of the net operating loss carryover from the current three years to five years for, lo for losses incurred in 2020 so that uh, businesses, especially small businesses, can claim losses over five years and reduce the tax burden uh, moving forward. So those are some of the uh, things that are being done already. Um, and uh, we will continue, of course, to, to uh, work on the economic recovery plan informed by uh, what the pain points really are according to our uh, stakeholders. So uh, for the small businesses, as I mentioned, we did a survey um, and uh, we're uh, targeting 
our uh, responses based on the felt pain points. Uh, we're doing a deeper dive uh, 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 public opinion research uh, with international partners in uh, understanding the pain points of the medium to large uh, enterprises. And so the, the response of government over the uh, immediate and short term, I've mentioned some of, uh, some of those elements. For the medium to long term, those are being formulated with the data we are gathering from the stakeholders themselves. Thank you, Asik. Uh, yes, Tony, uh, Willie, can make another comment yes, please. here? Yes, please, Ambassador. Uh, uh, Tony, I, I think uh, all of the uh, micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises are really, really thankful for the help and the support and all of the things you are doing for them. And uh, on the other hand, uh, they know that uh, this is not a sustainable thing, that uh, they will just look at the Department of Finance and wait for additional funding, additional loans, additional guarantees. So it's after the third month, the fourth month, the fifth month that they are now thinking about. They are worried about okay it's not sustainable they don't want to overburden the government they are very thankful for the help on the first month on the second month and perhaps even the third month but what about another month or two since there is no vaccine there is no uh, proof that this will all go away so they need to do something for their survival is that what the smes are telling us tony i, I just want to explain so that we will understand that it is not that they are not thankful, it's that, that they're worried, they know that whatever assistance is being given to them is not sustainable, and so they want to be able to help themselves. That is why they want to open as soon as they can, and they want to try, that's all. Yeah, um, indeed, Ambassador, that is uh, very well taken, and uh, the economic team is well aware of that um, and in constant dialogue with these stakeholders as well as on the other hand the uh, medical professionals and the epidemiologists and the data scientists we're trying to find a way to open up responsibly and uh, in ways that protect lives and livelihoods at the same time and uh, there is uh, no a silver bullet for that uh, we are going to have to uh, weigh various considerations. Uh, that is why there are proposals to open up based on certain guidelines. Again, I mentioned earlier, first, minimum health standards that need to be met in certain locations. Uh, the health system should be able to manage the peak of infections that are projected for that area, or else we will overburden the health system and it will collapse. Uh, so we need to make sure that uh, the outbreak uh, thresholds in particular areas are taken into account. Uh, the infection rate, or what some specialists call the r not, no? uh, how many other people does one infected person um, uh, infect in a given area? And so we have to make sure that that number is below one so that we know that we're flattening and dampening the curve at the same time. Uh, we also need to make sure that uh, those who are particularly vulnerable to uh, transmitting and to uh, being, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, mortally affected, no? those who will die uh, from, these, uh, from this infection, be protected. So uh, who will stay at home? Who will be allowed to work? Those considerations have to be put in place. I mentioned earlier the public transportation system. Will it be able to uh, allow for the distancing that is needed to reduce uh, infection. Um, comorbidities, uh, we know from uh, the global data that there are certain diseases uh, that increase the likelihood of mortality. So we also have to make sure that we take account of uh, those with, let's say, uh, hypertension, diabetes, uh, and other types of uh, uh, diseases uh, that are comorbid with, uh, with COVID-19. So again, there is, of course, a desire to get the economy back uh, up and running. Uh, we share that desire. I guess what I'm trying to share is we're trying to do it guided by science, guided by research, uh, and guided by our best ethical principles. Thank you. I, 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 think, we, I, I think we know that. Uh, let, let me just uh, say, this exchange of ideas between Tony, Lambino, and ourselves uh, is not a reflection of a disagreement. In fact, I just want you, Willie, uh, and all our panelists to know that we 
at PCCI can say, and Tony, I think, will agree, that we work very closely with each other, trying to develop common policies for the good of our country. So yes, I just sir, wanted to make that clear. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we've been partners for many years. Yes, sir. Yes. yes thank you. Asek, I'd just like to shift a bit. Uh, clearly, the national government is uh, facing some funding challenges as regards to COVID fight. And just last Friday, uh, Finance Secretary Dominguez said that while there are enough funds for now in the 2020 budget, there are just some funds that the uh, executive cannot readily tap because they have to be realigned. The Congress will be reconvening, I think, next week. Before, before. That's right. Yeah. Uh, will you be proposing a supplemental budget? And by how, how much should that be and for what exactly? Well, again, it, it will be informed, uh, the economic recovery plan, I mean, uh, which uh, NEDA is leading in uh, putting together with, uh, with other agencies, uh, will be informed by what the real pain points are. What are small, micro, medium, large businesses really feeling and what will be meaningful? Uh, what will also be meaningful in terms of job creation moving forward? The digital economy was mentioned earlier. Uh, that's a very big opportunity. Um, improving our healthcare system. Uh, and again, uh, the backbone of, of, of all of that, the infrastructure program, as well as uh, our social uh, investments in health and education will have to transform as well. Now, we know that young people are, uh, are quite, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, interactive. You know? They, uh, they uh, are more prone to spread the virus than, uh, than others, uh, other age groups, especially with the vulnerable population. Population. So all of these considerations will go into the economic recovery plan. The economic recovery plan will be costed, and that's when we will work with Congress for that. Uh, in terms of the emergency response that has been put in place, we have, of course, uh, been working with DBM in the lead to find where the funds can be sourced. Uh, the Bayanihan law provides uh, the president uh, extraordin extraordinary but temporary powers over the budget in order to finance these, uh, these emergency responses. Uh, the World Bank, uh, ABB, AIIB, other development partners, uh, because of our very good credit rating, have been willing uh, to lend to us. The Banco Central ng Pilipinas uh, has helped with their monetary actions and providing us with uh, a bond uh, repurchase uh, uh, program worth 300 billion pesos. So all of these things have come together for our immediate and short-term responses. But you're right. In terms of the economic recovery plan from the short from the short to medium term, how we bounce back and make sure that that's a U-shaped recovery and not a W-shaped recovery where we see a second bout of infection. Uh, some of our neighbors in the region uh, tried to open up too quickly. They, they as Secretary Dominguez said, uh, uh, put their uh, took their took their foot off the pedal, and uh, guess what? The the infection rate uh, zoomed ahead of them again. So now they're doing a second round. Of lockdown, um, there are there are lessons learned from our immediate uh, neighbors that we need to take into account in, in making all of this happen uh, in a purposeful and responsible way in terms of opening up uh, our economy again and making sure that we get on a positive growth trajectory that is purposeful, that is responsible, and that puts the best interests of the Filipino people first. So, do you have an amount that you're you'll be asking for? It's still being costed, uh, Willie, and uh, that uh, work is ongoing. And there are some specific proposals in the plan, as well as uh, what we're learning from the surveys that we're doing. Yeah, so let me, yes. Willie, I just yes, want to, to make a point no, uh, about, uh, uh, because Tony is saying about uh, having science guide our decisions. Uh, you know, our uh, data before were, you know, it's very unreliable, especially when the testing was very few and uh, it was uh, done only on very sick persons and we, we we really won't know what the situation is without uh, random mass testing and this is where i think the, there is talk about the partnership uh, between the government and the private sector and i think uh, in this uh, direction uh, i think uh, the businessmen especially uh, mr joey consortium and the others are trying to do some kind of mass testing uh, among uh, you know their workplaces so my point only is that uh, the, the government should really work very closely with the private sector in trying to, to find a way out of this crisis we have. 
Yeah, I just want to uh, highlight something that uh, Dr. Chikiamko mentioned, uh, working together, and that actually is happening. I know of several public-private uh, initiatives, uh, both between the IATF and the private sector, as well as uh, other groups such as DOH no? and the private sector in order to ramp up our, our mass testing. But again, it can't be just any kind of mass testing. Now, it has to be guided by uh, good practices, uh, what we know about this virus, um, and uh, I just wanted to highlight that because there are so many proposals for different types of mass testing. And we do know that the gold standard, of course, is the PCR test. Uh, um, so uh, that's something that we need to, uh, to keep in mind as we uh, move forward uh, with these public-private partnerships. Again, no, in order to uh, uh, reduce our infection rate from above one, where one person infects more than uh, more than one person to below one, where one person infects over time fewer than one person. No, I mean, uh, statistically, it, it sort of works out in terms of flattening and uh, dampening the curve. Um, uh, uh, in order to do that uh, effectively, we would need to be testing at uh, more than double the rate that we're testing today. So yes, uh, those partnerships are critical for uh, moving forward. Uh, also, not just the mass testing, but the contact uh, tracing that needs to go with it. Uh, we need to know where to find uh, the cases um, and uh, so that we can uh, isolate uh, people who might uh, be uh, vulnerable and might be spreading uh, the, the virus. So yes, uh, definitely, uh, but it has to be the right kind of mass testing uh, guided again by uh, the best that we know uh, from the experts in that field. Right. So it's 12 o'clock. I'd just like to read uh, some some uh, comments from some of our audience from Vlad Santos. Uh, a lot of innovations will result from this pandemic because they say that crisis makes the field uh, rich for for innovations. And another one from Joselle Dohelio. I agree this is an, av an avenue for the economy to go digital. However, not all, especially MSMEs, can shoulder the high cost of doing so. Now let's go to... Uh, yes, uh, any, any... Yeah, well, with respect to digital, I think, uh, uh, um, you know, the government has, uh, has uh, rightly prioritized the Public Service Act, which would hopefully... Uh, um, you know, uh, remove uh, telecom transportation from the list of public utilities and enable, uh, you know, uh, majority foreign ownership in those critical sectors. Um, in that regard, also, I think uh, uh, Congress is deliberating on a bill. It's the Open uh, 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 Access in Data Transmission Act. Um, unfortunately, it didn't get passed in the last uh, Congress, but uh, that will enable more players into the broadband space as you will not need any more a franchise to be able to put up uh, a broadband so those are the two critical things to make uh, uh, you know broadband and internet more affordable and more uh, accessible to majority of our filipinos um, can i come in yes please. can i come in here so i i want to make the point that uh, as as any crisis we really as a team meaning the government the private sector and uh, the, the donor community need to take advantage of this crisis to not to not waste it because yes. it's an opportunity to do many many things in the uh, to, to strengthen the medium to long-term uh, economic prospect of the country uh, one we mentioned uh, the, the digital economy definitely uh, there are other aspects also i think for instance the strengthening of the health system through this crisis is important because we generally tend to think of uh, the human capital building only, or at least uh, generally we focus more on the education part, but maybe a bit less on the health and a bit less on the social protection. But these are very important elements also of building human capital. So with the crisis and we know the strengthening of the health system and the need to trace, the need to do a good surveillance, the need to know where the vulnerable people are so that the social protection is efficiently going to them is all are very important because then going out of the crisis, the country will have a stronger health system and also a stronger social protection system. And together with education, that might also bring in some element of uh, digital uh, economy, you know, learn, distance learning, 
and all these other elements and innovation, this can really strengthen the human capital of the country. And then this will be essential for the medium to long term. Uh, Philippines wants to be a middle income country with you know, people you know, having a decent life uh, by 2040. I think this is a huge opportunity to build on these reforms that are essential to build human capital, to build the digitalization of the economy, to also do some reform for the private sector to be thriving, to attract investors, both, both domestic and uh, external investors, so that if there are shifts in the global economy, for instance, with a global value chain being uh, disrupted because of this crisis, Philippines can find ways to continue to grow some of these key sectors maybe partnering with some neighboring countries, with other new partners, but all of this will require some reforms to make the domestic economy very attractive. So let's not waste this crisis, take this opportunity to do the right reform, to continue to do the right reform, so that the country has more opportunity to grow in the medium to long term. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, we'll now have uh, parting words from our panelists. We'll start with you, Mr. Chikyam. Well, uh, my my point only is that uh, I think the government should should trust the private sector more. Um, uh, before it turned away from PPP and tried to do everything themselves, uh, just like the national ID. Uh, but I think uh, you know uh, the private sector is very much eager to work with the government to uh, not only to uh, you know do business but also to uh, help our people uh, improve the health system, etc. Because uh, Ultimately, it's, uh, 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 it's all about people. So the health of the people is important. So my, my uh, uh, point is that um, the government should, should uh, trust the, the private sector to um, behave responsibly. Uh, and therefore, its plan should uh, factor that in. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Chikyanko. We'll now go to Ambassador Yuiko, please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Willie. Uh, the biggest lesson we can learn from the COVID-19 crisis is that we are at war with an enemy that we cannot see. Each and every Filipino must realize that we have a common enemy to fight. And to win this war, we have to act as one and be united as a nation to achieve a common goal. If we do this, I think we will uh, overcome. Now, <clears throat> aside from the obvious preparation that we need to make sure that our country's health infrastructure, hospitals, clinics, etc., is adequate to meet the needs of universal health care for all, I believe that we should look at the following programs. Number one, we should make sure that there are strong incentives for doctors, nurses, medical technicians, and other health professionals so that they don't need to go abroad to seek opportunities for employment and to follow their dreams. If we have all of these health workers here, we, the Filipinos and the Philippines, will be better able to cope with whatever pandemic it is, whether it's COVID-19 or 20 or 21. The second point that I'd like to emphasize is we need to utilize technology and innovation. We need to implement a national citizen registration system. We need to use artificial intelligence for contact tracing, early hotspot risk detection, border protection for quarantine areas, big data for national monitoring of health statistics, etc. This can also help in disaster management, social amelioration programs, and the like. We do have the young people now in our country that know how to do this. So it is the challenge of private sector and the government to try to find who these people are, utilize their talents, and put them to good work. Thank you very much for the opportunity of being with you this afternoon. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's have you, Dr. Kalibati. Thank you very much, uh, Willie, and uh, my colleague panelists. It has been a very lively and interesting discussion. Um, to me, the big lesson seems to be that the preparedness, preparedness matters. Preparedness of a health system, 
to quickly have uh, any health crisis under control. The preparedness for business continuity if face-to-face -face interaction are constrained for whatever reason. Preparedness also uh, for policy, you know, policy preparedness by securing policy space like a monetary and fiscal uh, space in sunny days to save, to do the right reform that are needed for the economy to be stronger when we have a crisis like the COVID-19 so that we can also swiftly act in rainy days to protect the poor and vulnerable. By strengthening its preparedness along this dimension, I think the Philippines will be ready for the big shocks that will come in the future. Um, as a long-term partner of the Philippines, the World Bank stands ready to support through its policy advice. We have really scaled up our interaction with our key counterparts, the DOF, the BSP, uh, the, even the sectoral de department, agriculture, uh, the DICT, all the departments, we have had a very intense interaction since the outbreak, and we will continue to provide this uh, policy dialogue, advice, technical assistance through our analytical work, but also through our lending. Um, since uh, the COVID-19 outbreak, we have lent already uh, uh, for the health system with a hundred million emergency health project. We have done some budget support, uh, 500 million already uh, signed, and we are working on another 500. And we will continue our regular engagement with the government, and uh, we will do our best as a partner, a long-term partner, to be with the government in this crisis and all the stakeholders in the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. Finally, let's have you, Assistant Secretary Gambino. Thank you, Willie. Thank you to my co-panelists as well as to everyone who's watching right now. Um, it's important to note that at the first sign of local transmission uh, of COVID-19, uh, the president instituted a very quick and decisive uh, response uh, by uh, putting uh, the whole island of Luzon first in uh, under ECQ um, and uh, extending this as the curve uh, started to, uh, to flatten. Uh, and we will keep uh, flattening that curve and dampening it so that we protect lives and uh, enable the livelihoods of uh, Filipinos uh, to, to, to reflourish. No? Um, but it's also uh, important to note that before the pandemic hit, the Philippine economy was in a very, very good place. We had received a, a credit rating upgrade uh, just last year to triple B+. Uh, we we're managing our debts uh, Prudently, the tax reform program uh, was uh, instrumental in uh, making sure that our revenue flows uh, were robust. In fact, uh, the best in decades uh, in terms of the performance in uh, 2018 and 2019. Um, in addition, our expenditure program, especially in the infrastructure space, uh, was bringing our, uh, our expenditure performance to also record highs in uh, two or three decades. So all of those things came together in order to put us in a good position to make our initial responses uh, toward this uh, pandemic. Um, but uh, as mentioned, uh, there are uh, needs uh, for the short to medium term um, that uh, the preparation that we have done uh, will not be sufficient for because the scale of this pandemic is much larger than the regular uh, set of crises that we face every year. So uh, we need to continue our uh, tax reform program to strengthen um, our uh, ability to give incentives uh, in areas where we need uh, to, to uh, rekindle growth. Uh, we need, uh, as mentioned by the other panelists, to really roll out the national ID system properly. Um, uh, that is one of the marching orders the president gave uh, Acting Secretary Carl Chua, uh, the implementation of the national ID system in as quick uh, possible time. Uh, a quick a time as possible. Um, and uh, we also um, uh, need to make sure that the effectiveness are, of our response in terms of this uh, economic recovery plan de depends on the accuracy of our diagnosis. That is why we are trying to understand the needs of the business sector uh, as much as possible as we craft this response plan. Um, moving forward, uh, this plan, of course, will be implemented uh, still uh, with a focus on our infrastructure program uh, to improve the connectivity backbone, both physical and uh, digital. And we will need to keep investing in our social programs, especially our health system and also transforming our education system so that it can uh, operate 
uh, and, uh, and educate our youth under the new normal that will emerge uh, once we are uh, past the pandemic. So thank you very much and a good afternoon to everyone. Thank you, Asek. Actually, suddenly I have a flood of questions, but unfortunately, and uh, we beg your pardon that we cannot field them right now. What we will be doing uh, to those who ask questions is that uh, uh, we will write articles on them. You can uh, read them on our website. We'll ask them of our panelists uh, outside of this forum. Um, and actually, there are a lot of issues that we were planning to, to take up, but because this this discussion so lively, we couldn't uh, tackle all of them. But that's it for today's Business World Insights. Uh, we thank our audience and our big and a big thank you to our guest experts. Join us next week, May 6, for our second online forum on understanding the new normal for business. Stay healthy till then. Thank you.